recognize easily is great. He made this entire cosmos that we that we are in right now. Um, all of the things that exist made a great thing. But all of us today uh, woke up and we're breathing and we're functional and we're going about our day and that is also a great thing. Even in all the little tiny mundane things that we take for granted, God is great. And we want to take some time this morning uh, to respond to him, to tell him that we recognize his greatness um, and we want to thank him for it and tell him that we love him. This morning, uh, the musical part of our worship is going to be brought by one of our student <laughs> chapel bands that is called by a color that I don't remember, so um, I will. Um, if you are here and you have some kind of musical talent, I don't care how big or how little it is, if you play a little bit of guitar, if you can keep rhythm on a drum, if you play the violin or the kazoo, if you can freestyle or you can sing, um, uh, I want you to, to, to reach out to me or to, to Esther or Ryan. And let us know what, what talent you have. And, and, uh, and we'll see if we can find a place to use that in our musical worship of God. Um, and then our speaker today is our very own Dr. Todd Jones. Except we're working on the doctor. Um, um, and uh, he's going to be sharing with us, continuing with our theme of finding the good. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to share for us. Um, and so let me ask before I, I turn it over to our, our musical team, I want to ask you right now to just pre prepare your head and prepare your heart. Because here is my deep belief. That if we all do our jobs right, you do your job, I do mine, they do, we all do our jobs right, then at some point in time this morning, you're going to come into contact with, uh, with, with Christ, with God's Spirit, um, with, with God Himself. And when you come into contact with God, you should not expect to leave the same way as you came. And so if we just come this morning and take this next hour to expect that, that God will show up, and if we do our job and show up, that things will be different in small ways or big ways. I don't know, but if we can trust that, then I think that God, um, I think God will be very pleased with what happens today. Bow very quickly, God. We love you. We ask that you would meet us here this morning as you have promised that you would. Um, we pray this in your name and in the name of your Son Jesus, who's alive today. We invite you to stand with us. <laughs> stand with us and join us as we praise God.
song that we're going to sing is a new song, and it's called Faithful Now. And some of the words in the chorus say, You make mountains move, you make giants fall, and you use songs of praise to shake prison walls. And each of those lines represents a Bible story. And if you don't know what they are, I'm going to read you one of them. Um, so the Acts 16, 25 to 26 says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And so in this story, their praise literally opened the prison doors for them. And so after we sing this next song, I hope that you guys will be able to worship and to see what doors God will open for you. So please sing with us.
God, we thank you for this chance to be able to come together and worship your name, God. I ask now that as we prepare to hear from Todd, that you open our ears to what you want us to um, hear. God, I ask that you give um, Todd the spirit of words that you want him to say. Um, I ask that his message is conveyed in the way that you intended for it to be conveyed and that we are able to listen um, properly. In your name we pray. Jones, I teach Christian ministry here, and that's enough about me. So, 
Brian has gotten us started down the track of getting the story off to the correct start. I am really passionate about this. I love Genesis. It's how I was going to say it's my favorite book of the Bible, or so you asked me about Ecclesiastes, or really any other one, and then that one's my favorite. But I love this story. I love what's going on here. I do think that all the times that I heard it before I got to Great Lakes, I had completely missed the point. So I'm delighted to be able to share it with you in case you're happening to not get it in your classes. This is just like a huge key theme that you've got to understand. Getting this story started off on the right foot is absolutely crucial. And so we're going to do that. I'm going to do a quick recap of some of the things that Brian did last week, and then we're going to move forward in the story until we get to conflict. And I know that sounds like a downer, like we're going to head towards conflict, but think about every story that you've ever heard. You know, they rarely go, once upon a time, they lived happily ever after. You know, usually there's something that happens in between, and that's what we're going to be getting into, is setting up the conflict and setting up the problems that we're going to be experiencing as humanity in this created world that Brian unpacked last week. So we begin with a formless void, which means nothing to me. And so I had a thought about how to help you understand exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about a formless void. Has, has anyone in here ever been surfing? Like, no, of course not. We live in Michigan. Well, there's like two hands and there's like in the deep in the back. I've seen people surf on Lake Michigan before. It's just sad. I, like, I, whatever. It's neither here nor there. I spent the briefest time in California. I had a chance to do some body surfing in California, but also uh, tried it out in Hawaii as well. The waves are different. But they have this one thing in common. When you get eaten by a wave, you fail to catch it, you sort of like get tossed back into it or sort of enveloped by it. And then uh, this amazing sensation happens. Amazing, maybe terrible is actually a better word. Sensation happens where uh, you start tumbling. You sometimes get like smacked against the bottom of the ocean and you start getting pulled while you're simultaneously getting compressed. You feel like your arms are going to get torn off and yet you can't breathe because your chest is being pushed in on. Surfing's really fun. You should try it sometime. But when you get eaten by a wave, you tumble and you lose track of which way is up. You can actually, if you're in deep enough water, swim the wrong direction because you think you're going up and you're not. And you just get compressed and pulled and smacked and shoved. And then you get deposited up on shore and for some reason turn around and head back in the water and do it again. But that sensation of just getting beat to death by chaotic water is formless void. It's not per se that there was nothing, but there was no distinction. There was no up or down. There was nothing differentiated from anything else. There was just this endless potential. And out of that potential, we have a God who speaks into existence, the creation of some interesting things. Brian highlighted the symmetry last week, and I'm going to try and unpack the symmetry a little as we move forward. First, we see God differentiates the light from the darkness. There's this, now you can tell when something is illuminated or when something is dark. And then soon after that, you have this, this division of the waters above and the waters below to create some space into which some things can be made. But that's still not quite enough because we also have to separate the waters so that land can appear. Now we have, we've got this space carved out and we've got to fill it up with stuff. So the sun is to govern the day and the moon is to govern the night and the light and the darkness are differentiated and they also have objects that just float around up there to help us understand when which is happening. And then we have the waters above and the waters below that are filled with birds and with fish. You might be thinking, you know, like water's above. Like, yeah, the sky is blue, right? And before planes and rockets exist, yeah, it's water up there, sure. Like, it's fish and birds. And then the, the last day, we see the space gets filled, that gets created with all the, the creatures that move along the ground and plant life and vegetation and all these things. And then the pinnacle of creation, which is you. <coughs> Which, you know, in most, I started by saying, in most accounts of the creation story, I feel like they sort of miss the point and don't quite get it. But uh, that part we often get. And so I'm hoping that you're coming in with at least that assumption. And if you didn't, you got it last week with Brian. You are the pinnacle. Like, ah, okay, creation is ready now. Let's start now that we have humans here. Because God wants to hang out with them. <coughs> which is sort of a crazy thought. But this is how we begin. It's just, sadly, that's not where we stay. So Adam and Eve are given paradise with infinite time to be able to explore it and enjoy it. They're also given a choice because they're not automatons that are set to programming and they walk out their programming and do exactly what they're uh, created to do. They are given the option 
to participate. Do you want to be part of this or not? And that option expresses itself in part in this existence of this tree, this tree that has fruit on it, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they're not supposed to have. And what's interesting, too, is it's not clear that they're not supposed to have it forever, but certainly right now they're not supposed to have it. And again, it's unclear how God wants to play out things going forward. Maybe God had every intention of slowing down the process and helping them understand good and evil over a period of time, and the tree represents a shortcut, or maybe God was going to give them the tree once they had more time to understand, explore, and mature in the creation. But regardless, they say, nah, we don't want that. God's way sounds different or hard or whatever, and I'm going to go do it my way. So they venture out, they make the choice, the creation begins to collapse, and we have this problem. They can't live forever now because things are in a broken state, so they need to be evicted from the garden and enter out into the creation at large. Paradise is lost, so to speak. They experience freedom, right? And we have to do the scary scare quotes because it's not. It's an exchange. They could have served God, but they've exchanged that instead to serve themselves and now to serve the powers of sin and darkness, which have sort of been let loose on the creation. God asked to move them from the garden where they were intended to live forever because death was part of it. This was not the intent. But here we are. Cain kills his brother Abel, Adam and Eve's children. This sets a pattern that gets established and then escalated upon. Very soon we find that the creation is defined by violence, defined by exploitation. And instead of having human beings bearing the image of God, sort of representing God to one another, instead you now have these classes of people that emerge. The exploiters and the exploited. Very few people in the exploiters category, and we've got a real problem. The creation has descended into a state that I'm not sure we can come back from. And again, this is a problem because of all the things that we've already established. God created creation with you in mind. God creates you. You are the pinnacle, the chief, the top, the best, and now you're destroying everything. So what? Like, what's the move? We read about how God feels about this transition in Genesis 6. I'm going to read it for us. I didn't give it to the guys, so it's not going to be on the screen. So you can just follow along with me. This is from Genesis 6, verses 5 and following. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humans was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humans on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the humans I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. We have to mention Noah so that we all are aware of where we're at in the story. Far too often, when I hear the story about Noah's Ark out of the mouths of other people, I, I hear it as, then God got upset and God sort of like rained down wrath or something. I just want to take a moment to pause because that's not getting the story started off correctly. Brian was really clear about how high the stakes are to understanding where the story begins. And the story does not begin with the humans were supposed to obey, they didn't, God's super angry, now they're punished. That's not actually what's happened at all. Anger is not the emotion in play. Grief, sorrow, sadness, the kind of sadness that results from Betrayal. Out of this betrayal, God experiences grief, not anger. That's just not what's happening. This isn't an act of wrath. This is an act of regret. You can imagine or get the sense, I wish there were another way, but things are too far gone. You need to do something, and that something has to happen right now. This class, exploiters and exploited, this isn't the design for creation. This isn't the intent for humans. This isn't the image of God. This isn't the grand, glorious promise that God created humans into. Instead, we've got this wrecking, this systematic dismantling. It has to be undone. It has to be corrected. So let's focus on the grief for just a moment before we get into the correction, because Noah's Ark story is likely pretty familiar. We'll get there, uh, but hang with me for a moment. God responding with grief rather than anger, communicates some really crucial things for us. The first one, violence and destruction is not what God wanted for humanity. 
Is that obvious? I mean, it's like, like okay, mm -hmm. I thought you were a professor. Let me teach my, you know, this, but it is not obvious, I think. It's not obvious in part because of how often we opt in to those systems of violence and oppression and destruction. But, but it's not obvious also because of how common it is. You know, in, in uh, our sociology class, we talk about cultural norms all the time, the kinds of things that you experience that you don't notice, but they're actually a little bit odd, but that we've all got desensitized to them to the extent that it all makes perfect sense. When we go to the cafeteria and a line just starts forming down the hallway and no one has to talk about how to do that, we're just used to it. That's what you do. There's time to go to the cafeteria and there's too many people to get food right now. We form a line and we track down the hallway and we talk about whatever and then when it's our turn, we get our food. How do you know that? Because it's just like that all the time. That's what it always is like. How do we know that the earth is a violent, dangerous place? Was that supposed to happen? Is that what was intended? You know, and again, I want to declare, no, of course not. We have God looking at the state of affairs and going, I am so sad that this is where it ended up. So sad and so filled with grief that God says, I have to do something. So the first thing, again, is this reminder. This is not how it's supposed to be. The violence, the pain, the betrayals, the difficulty that we experience, that's not the intent. That's not what you're made for. The second thing that I think the grief shows us is that if God is experiencing grief, that means God opened up himself to you. Let me explain for just a moment. Right? You're, in, you're in history class. Doug or Lloyd is telling you about a 2,000-year-old king who died, and you just, like, that was somebody's dad. That was somebody's child. That was somebody's sibling, right? That when they died, there were people who experienced great sadness at their death. But you don't. You just write down your notes, and you get ready for your test, and you, you just go on with your life, and you have no emotional response whatsoever to finding out that Julius Caesar is a guy who is now dead. And there is a sense in which some of you go, who cares at all? I don't want anything to do with history, and that's not what I'm talking about. I just mean this person is so far removed from your experience that you, you don't have an emotional connection that's going to lead you towards sadness. Julius Caesar is gone. Oh, no, like how am I going to get any sleep tonight? If you don't know him, and you have no concept or whatever that's going to connect you to him, which is a very different thing than saying, your best friend died. You are now going to experience grief. You're going to learn about grief and its death in a way that would not be possible were it anyone else. And to have God look down at the creation, not with anger, but with grief, and say, I can't believe that it got this bad. I regret this whole thing. That means God opened up to live in the realm of metaphor. God opened his heart and let you in, let all of us in, and said, I'm going to love you. And it's out of that risk, the inherent risk of entering relationship that God is experiencing grief when betrayal sets in. You can imagine God like a parent looking at siblings fighting, or you can imagine God like a spouse with a wife that's cheating. You can imagine all of these sorts of betrayal, and you can see grief is the only thing that makes any sense. And God having more emotional maturity than we do often. Uh, anger isn't a part of the equation. We might cover our grief with anger, but God sees the grief for what it is and says, I regret this and I wish it could be different. Now this is connected to number three, and this is a part of the story that, again, I think that we really need to get right. I said connected to number three. This is number three, and it's connected to number two. This is the part of the story that we miss or, or don't uh, internalize well enough which is that if God is experiencing grief about the choices that humans are making, that means the choices that humans are making can have an impact on how things go, can have an impact on God. When was the last time you were tasked with that responsibility? Because that, it feels, just to me, it feels like I almost never was. And again, things were different once I got to Great Lakes. I went here, I don't know if that's been clear, it was a long time ago. Um, <coughs> And I was confronted with this reality. Things like, you pray. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay, we're supposed to pray. I get it. We're supposed to pray. Everybody tells me that all the time. Well, why? Because it, like, it actually does something. Nobody seems to tell me that. <laughs> and I had to learn that the hard way. And similarly, we're reading this story. God is grieved looking down at the choices that humans are making, meaning that the choices that we make can bring grief. And the choices that we make can bring joy and satisfaction and enjoyment and fulfillment. That's called 
relationship. And I'm still, to this day, shocked that that's how it works, that that's how creation was made, that I can have any impact at all on anything in God's design or in God himself. I am shocked by that reality and that truth. And yet it bears out everywhere we look in the scripture. And the story starts on the assumption that your actions can have an impact on the God who created everything. If we really understood that, it's grief, not anger, that results in this flood thing. Now I want to talk about the flood because it sounds like there was rain and things got wet, and that's not what it was. Do, you know, do these sort of exaggerated hand gestures because I want you to understand, again, what's actually happening in the story. But I've got a snippet from Genesis chapter 7 that really illuminates kind of the whole occasion for us. This is chapter 7, verse, the second half of verse 11. <coughs> On that day, talking about when the flood began, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and all the windows of the heavens were open. Burst forth and what, what, remember these gestures? In the act of creation, God differentiates light from darkness, and then God separates the waters vertically, and then separates the waters horizontally, fills that space. And then God says, I regret how much destruction and violence there is, and I'm going to undo this. So what does God do? Oh, make it a little wet. Oh, it's wet now. Okay, now we'll make it not wet. No, God collapses the boundaries of creation until it all smashes in, gets eaten by a wave, its rim, limbs get ripped off, and it's got this immense pressure on its chest, and we descend back into formless void. The creation is uncreated. Reset. And there's this ark, which, what does that even mean? Right? Hebrew people in here, what does that word even mean? I, look, there's this thing that you're in that's protecting you. You are Noah in this, I guess, analogy, right? There's this thing that's protecting Noah and his family that's in the smashed creation that has collapsed back in on itself. And then what happens? Over a course of time, the waters recede and it's new creation. A resurrection of sorts. That's a little too on the nose. We better move on and <laughs> stick with Old Testament stuff. Noah's Ark emerging from the chaotic waters of the formless void is creation again. And then very quickly, Noah eats a fruit in abundance and excess that he's maybe not supposed to in that way. Talking about the fruit of the vine, as it says, he planted a vineyard and he had some wine from his vineyard. And then some kind of undisclosed, unclear, really shameful act occurs, and we see the cycle is about to repeat. Just like we have to understand the descent into violence through Cain and Abel and all of the things that follow after that, we have to understand that Noah and his family are Adam and Eve again. 2.0, they're just doing it again. Which is again to remind all of us, in case we're wondering, if we had been there. You ever think about that, right, Adam and Eve? You're like, ah, oh, man, if I had been there, I just wouldn't have touched the tree of knowledge of Eve and just lived forever in paradise. Wouldn't that be great? I'm sorry, you burst your bubble. You would not have. It would not have. This is just what we're like, and what we see emerging is necessity. What we see out of this is the necessity that humans are going to need help. We're not just going to be able to willpower through it. We're not going to be able to get enough fresh starts that we'll get it right this time. That's just not how it's going to work. We're going to need help. We're going to need to engage in partnership. There's going to need to be more than just me. So we read how the recreation event sort of plays out in chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. Uh, let me read this section for us as well. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humans, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. inclination of the human heart is evil for me. That sounds familiar to me. Like from, you know, 12 minutes ago in our time together. Wait a second, like, 
I am pretty sure, and in fact have the notes right here to confirm, that's the reason God uncreated. Every inclination of the human heart is only evil from youth, is the reason that God is so grieved. God destroys the creation in this act of uncreation, recreates it, opens space back up for a new project to begin, and then God says, I will never do that again because every inclination of the human heart is evil. Okay. Do you realize what this means? I'm not sure I did. Somebody helpfully pointed it out to me. Here is what I'm thinking this means. If God is able to make the declaration to never uncreate again on the basis that God knows what humans are about, that means God is making an irrevocable promise to chase us forever. Only this time, God knows exactly what God's getting into. God knows exactly the kinds of people we are. God knows exactly the kinds of mistakes we're going to make. And God says, I'm in it. I am in it. I've got this toxic friend, and I'm just going to stick with him. Every inclination of the human heart is only evil from you. This declaration is, oddly, one of the most encouraging statements that God has ever made. You know, we look up and we go, you know that, and you're still with us? You're still choosing to dwell with us? You're still chasing us? You're leaving 99 to come find us? You know what I am. You know what I've done. You know what I think that I don't say out loud. You know what I've seen. You know what I go through. You know what I've put other people through. You're still, you're still here. Are you sure you don't want to collapse it all back in? I would not blame you if you did. But no. But no, God makes the declaration. God places the bow in the sky. You can ask Sam about that in your OT class, about what bows are and what they mean. And says, I'm not going to do this again. Instead, something is going to change. Something is going to be different. Instead of just giving the humans the creation to explore and cultivate and enjoy, we now recognize the humans are, are not going to respond particularly well to that responsibility. And so something more has to occur. We've got... Humans aren't allowed to just kill stuff willy-nilly. Right? We move into chapter 9 and you see some interesting things happen. The human lifespan gets shortened. That was back in chapter 6. So we've got less time to accumulate ways of hurting each other because we're pretty good at that. And the more time you give us, the better at it we get. We've also got a differentiation between people groups to create some competition among people. You know, the Tower of Babel thing. You ever wonder why the languages were confused? Those boundaries and competition prevent them from all grouping up together to do battle with God, which is uh, maybe not a good thing in the creation. And the animals are going to be afraid of people, which is an interesting note because it gives us an odd uh, tangential insight into what it was like before the flood occurred. The animals are going to be afraid of people and maybe not talk anymore. I don't know. Again, you can ask Sam about that. These are some passive protections that just get set down. Right? The creation spiraled into a bad state. And I know what you're thinking, or at least what you might have been thinking back when we were talking about it initially. So God's going to do this act of uncreation. The only ones that are going to survive are Noah and his family. But like, what about all the innocent people? Didn't a bunch of innocent people die? No. Um, the only innocent ones were on the ark, or the boat, or the box, or the whatever that thing is supposed to be. And now we start over with them. We start over with the innocent people, and the descent begins again anew. We refresh it. New creation, they're starting over. And God says, I'm going I'm to change these sort of fundamental qualities of how the creation works. Animals are going to run from you. I'm going to demand an account of lifeblood. Languages are going to be confused. You're not going to live as long. We're just going to set up the whole stage differently so that this, this problem gets a little bit more contained. You go, okay, great, like guardrails. That, guard, that makes sense. You do this with kids a lot. We put fences up and put gates up and stuff to prevent them from playing in the street. So guardrails are good, but like, God, does it seem like you should do something? God just like set the stage. It's like it's pretty clear we're doing damage to each other, we're doing damage to ourselves. Are you going to do something? And the answer is yes. In response to all of this, in response to the knowledge of how people are in response to, the, to, to God's awareness and understanding of what happened if we're left to our own devices. In response to all of that, put all of that together and we see this in chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, 
Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Never again can destroy the creation because every inclination of the human heart is only evil all the time. Hey, random dude named Abram, do you want a new name? What is happening? What is that? Moving from chapter 11 to chapter 12, what is that? I think what we see is something I alluded to earlier. God is aware of what we're going to do if left by ourselves, and so God says, I'm coming. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you, and I'm not going to do it for you. And this is the part that boggles my mind still. This notion that my actions actually can affect God, that I can pray and that God can move, that things actually are impacted by decisions that I make. I'm not just existing in isolation or in a vacuum over here by myself, and nothing I do really matters. Oh, it's quite the opposite. We build worlds and we destroy realities with uh, the relationships that we have. The vulnerabilities that we have in our friendships and in our romantic relationships and with our family members and even with our professors and with authority figures in our life. We can do harm or we can do good. And when God looks at the creation, God is not content to just let it spiral off the deep end and just become this terrible place that's awful to be in. God says, I'm going to address this. I'm going to work on it. But in order to respect and in order to allow humans to maintain their position of image of God, they've got to be involved. I can't just step in and do it for them, or they'll become the automatons that God never created us to be. And so God says, instead of set it all correct, and you all just toe the line and do exactly what I say all the time, every time, we have invitation. Invitation. This invitation gets repeated over and over again in Scripture, the invitation that goes to Abram that says, leave behind the things you find comfortable and join me in the solution. And Abram does it, and he doesn't do it perfectly. And you're going to hear stories about that as we move deeper into the semester. But Abram does it. And out of Abram, we trace this lineage, the lineage of faith, but also the lineage of people through descendants move us up through Moses and these other characters in the Bible story until we land at Jesus. And we have Jesus again saying, I'm going to do all the heavy lifting, but I'm not going to do it all for you. And this is getting the story of the scripture started off right. The story of scripture is not decide to believe a thing, and it's all good. The story of scripture is not trick your friends into believing that same thing too, and it's all good for them too. The story is about actual restoration of things that are actually broken, putting things back together that have been separated, rejoining that which is good among humanity, and you are invited to participate in that. I can't think of better news until we get to Jesus and we find out exactly how full those promises are going to be fulfilled. And that's what you are, and that's what this story is. You have been invited to participate in the goodness that God is bearing out in this broken place. Is anybody here who can say, I never have any problems, everything goes really smooth for me all the time? I do not think so. And I'm also not promising that that's going to change something when you become part of the solution. But I am going to tell you that becoming part of the solution can have a real impact. It can actually affect things. It can affect your friendships, your relationships, your relationship with God and this world in which we live. So if you look around and you think this place could be better, I don't just mean Great Lakes, I mean this world in which we inhabit could be better. There's real answer. There's a real answer to that problem. Partnering with God to restore it. There's an invitation, and I'm inviting you to consider it. Let's pray. God in heaven, we're, we're sort of awed by being invited to anything by you. It sort of feels like we've heard that there's so many times, but you just keep making ways. You just keep making space. You keep setting a chair at the table for us, and we're, we're blown away. We're blown away that you want to help us at all. We're blown away that we get to play any part in it, and we're, we're ready to the extent that we can be. Father, I pray for courage to accept this invitation in the hearts of all of us here. 
pray that we would gain a clearer understanding about what your designs are for us. And we can make wise choices and be part of your solution. And we're proud to be your people. We're proud to serve you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sure. <coughs> Couple of quick announcements here. Um, so uh, again, on the screen, uh, you should see the uh, the text alerts uh, number. Uh, this is for uh, emergencies or extremely important information. Uh, we will not send you out a bunch of text about uh, about dumb stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, text join to this if you want to be a part of that system. Uh, next slide, sir. Blood drive on the 15th, Friday the 15th. Greg, if you raise your hand, please. Uh, Greg is the guy to get in touch with with this. We're still looking for volunteers. We're still looking for cookies. Yeah. We're still looking for homemade cookies. We're for blood, though, really. <laughs> and really what we're looking for is for cookies. How many of you in here have family members or you yourself um, have had to receive blood as part of a really important medical procedure? Anybody? So, so you guys know exactly how critical this is. Um, and I've, I've been in situations praying with people uh, for whom the right amount of blood was not necessarily readily available. Um, and the amount of just anxiety and stress that that creates is just tremendous. So help us uh, alleviate 